Hello, this is Deborah, Guilty Feminists. I wanted to let you know that we are back live at King's Place on the 31st of January, the 14th of February, Valentine's special, but obviously Guilty Feminist Twist, and the 21st of March. Book now for those shows to make sure you get tickets. If you missed out on my stand-up show, I'm doing it next at WOW, that's the Women of the World Festival, at the South Bank Centre on Saturday, the 12th of March. If you're in Dublin or you can get to Dublin, we are at Vicar Street on the 14th of March. Alison Spittle and I will be back for a Guilty Feminist there. Can't wait. And very excitingly, our UK tour starts on the 5th of March in Brighton. Then we go to Nottingham, Oxford, Bath, Cambridge, Northampton, Liverpool, Sheffield, Stratford, Reading, Canterbury, York, Birmingham, Cardiff, Newcastle, Manchester, Glasgow, and London. And it finishes on the 1st of October. So check out the website for all of those shows and for dates when we're coming near to you. That's guiltyfeminist.com. Please come. We're so excited to be able to see you bring friends. It's going to be a wonderful time. We will also be in Australia and New Zealand in July. We are coming to Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane and Canberra. And we're also coming to Wellington, Christchurch and Auckland. Get your tickets now because Grace Petrie and I are on our way. And you can find ticket links for all of these shows in the podcast show notes or at guiltyfeminist.com. And now on with the podcast. I'm a feminist, but today I read that there has been hardly any studies done into female psychopaths, so we don't actually know how many female psychopaths there are. There might be loads, and we're not being counted, and we're not being represented again. I'd love to do a study on female Very psychopaths. Very unfair. I would love you to do one. You'd be ideal. And also, I, w- I wonder if it's like a lot of other kind of areas of study in psychology or biology where female psychopaths would actually end up being defined slightly differently to male psychopaths. And that's why they, they might think, oh, there's less of them. But because it's the criteria that they're using or something like that. Well, then I saw another article that said that uh, female psychopaths are much less likely to kill than male psychopaths. Because I was thinking about... Do men uh, kill more because they're psychopathic? But it turns out Mm. psychopaths don't kill more than the rest of the population. They kill a little bit more. But what they know from the limited studies they've bothered to do about women is, guess what? Female psychopaths Mm. kill much more infrequently than male psychopaths. Surprise, surprise, because uh, violence is a male problem in the main. Yeah. Um, I was reading this week about the PMS defence. So, which, which has been um, only ever successfully used, I think, in this country. It's never been used successfully in America. But um, it's for women who have very, very extreme menstrual rages. Oh. And then I went down a real, um, what would you call it, like an internet hole, where every article you read goes to a weirder article. So I, <laughs> then, I was then reading on a... Uh, a message board which was women asking questions about what happens if I die with a tampon inside me and I was like what does happen if you die and and essentially they take it out of you at the funeral parlor I was like great Ooh. good good to know I would not like and that what then taking a tampon out or no, no thinking about it dying knowing I had one in me and someone else was going to take it out yeah I actually don't use tampons but no. Thank God. And now it's even more reason because what if I get hit by a bus and it was in mm. there? Because that would be my last thought. Oh, my God, someone's going to take it out. I'm yeah. horrified. So um, all of my feminist butts are uh, pregnancy related. Right. I, I'm a feminist, but I'm pregnant. And I've discovered that pregnancy is not very feminist at all. <laughs> Oh, I've been really shocked way? by it. Well, this, uh, this current uh, bit that I'm in the last few weeks, and all they tell you is it's hormones. Desperation to do housework. Desperation <gasps> to do it and then deep-seated pleasure while doing it. No. They call it nesting, which is how they're trying to hide the fact that whatever your body is doing to you is very unfeminist. I have been, and bear in mind, my hips ache, my um, back hurts, and if I stand up, my legs fill with fluid. They just swell up. I have 
discovered this love for ironing my husband's shirts. Stop it I've, right now. I've become now. the most conventional woman. I'm literally with child standing. My husband is just watching TV sprawled out and I'm showing him going, is that good enough? He doesn't care. He doesn't want them ironed. I'm rooting through his things trying to <gasps> find creased stuff. So unfeminist. So you've become Betty Draper from Mad Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just invasion of the body snatchers that's taken it's you over. Complete personality change. Complete personality change. Oh my god! Because you've never been like that. I've never known you to iron a shirt. So I'm a very a scruffy, shirt. messy person living in a shit hole. <laughs> and yeah, it's all pregnancy. And again, I'm speaking from personal. I'm not saying that is all pregnant women. But actually, if there's any pregnant women listening, thinking, "Well, I don't want to tidy up," please like DM me, and I'll come round your house. And I'll uh, iron everything for you. You're Monica from Friends. You're actually going to come to their door and do it, yes. even if they don't want yeah. it. Oh, I love this. I love this. I'm, I'm definitely inviting you over for a cup of tea and then you won't be able to control yourself when you see, you know, my downstairs cupboard. Um, I'm a feminist, but I just read that Emma Raducanu lost 6061 by a tennis player called Rabakina of Kazakhstan in 55 minutes at the Australian Open. And I was sorry to hear it, but I was also relieved a little bit because I heard her described at Christmas as a perfect person and I was beginning to compare myself. So Ooh. it's nice to know she's human and she can be, in fact, the article said she was annihilated. And I was mm. like, oh God, uh, I don't want that from Ricardo. I think she's fantastic. Love her, love her, love her, love her. Delighted whenever she wins. Mm. There was a little piece of me that went, oh, she's not a perfect person. No, not a perfect person. Isn't it odd how those jealousies come up? I get jealousy when um, people die and then everyone says that they were the <laughs> nicest, kindest, funniest. Um, a comedian, I won't name him, but a comedian, a really beloved comedian died a few days ago who I've never worked with and I don't know. And I got this irrational jealousy because everyone kept saying he was the nicest comedian around. And I was like, well, actually, you haven't met me and I'm very nice and I shouldn't be like struck out of this competition. Okay. Can I say the worst thing? This is even worse than that, Sarah. Yeah. I'm a feminist, but once I was at a wedding and the groom said to the bride in his speech, you're the best person I know. And a little piece of me inside <laughs> went, you know me. <laughs> Yes, what? yes. And I was like, and the yeah. thing is, it's not that she's not a good person, yeah. but I feel she has some qualities mm. that are quite on the edge. And yeah. I was like, you know me, and I don't think she is a better person than me. I genuinely thought that. I, I've had that too at a wedding. It was actually a dad's speech to about his daughter, and it was so hyperbolic in his praise. I had that exact same thing. My hackles raised at the back of my neck. But we all going to kind of like – Disagree now. <laughs> we now be more reasonable about this. Wedding speeches are lies. Yeah. They are. It's like people just suddenly are beatified. And so I'm a feminist, but um, I'm pregnant, and I've discovered that pregnancy is not very feminist. So, for instance, as we know, first rule of feminism, the main point is equality. And um, when you're pregnant, your mind and body becomes very intently concentrated on the well-being of one person in my case a small little white man and um it's changed the voices in my head so the the, the inner monologue that used to say see things in the news and think things like oh god all children should have school meals then has an extra addendum which says but my kid's gonna have the biggest meal <laughs> oh. or, or my kid's gonna have the nicest food and then yeah, you'll see horrible things happening all over the world and you go, oh, God, everyone should just have basic human rights and they should be respected. Whether they'd end up, my child's going to have the most human rights. <laughs> and uh, and it's so it's so unfeminist. It's actually very Tory, even though I think it does come from a good place originally, which is love. Very, It's very worrying. Mm, that's so interesting. In that moment, you're protecting that little person inside of you mm. and you're thinking that he's the best boy and he deserves the best things and yes. he deserves more well, love than It's everyone. not even that he's the best. He could be the worst boy. He's still going to get the best stuff. Oh, he, wow. Brain, you were talking about psychopaths earlier. You have these thoughts like, well, what if they're a murderer? Well, then I'll, I'll hide everything. I'll hide the bodies. <laughs> like this odd, this odd thing, wow. which is obviously evolutionary, but it's also very scary. 
<gasps> it's very scary. Invasion of the body snatchers. It's what Invasion happens. Invasion of the body snatchers, yes. Oh my God. I'm so fascinated by that. I've been joking about it with people, but sometimes I worry, is this the end of my feminism? Because I'm just going to worship this little man now for the rest of my life and <laughs> dedicate myself. You have this, I was reading a book that was recommended that with children, with toddlers, you should get them involved with housework as a game, even when they can't really help you. So they understand the idea that it's just expected. Yeah. And I was reading it going, mm, I think my little prince will just be sitting there. I think I'll just be, I mean, because I'm so obsessed with housework, I'm like, well, I'll be doing everything. So wow. that will, and that's how you cause the problem men. That's how this cycle yes. continues. So that the man you raise will end up expecting yeah. his partner being, yeah. to do everything. And, and he'll think that's love. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's such a responsibility, isn't it? But now your instincts are fighting your better judgment. There's two of you inside, your better judgment, which knows your feminist rational brain, and then the instinctive part of you, which just goes, he must be protected, worshipped, mm. cosseted, yes. adored. Oh, come, let us adore him. <laughs> Do you <laughs> think it. Mary just had a sort of postnatal psychosis where she thought her son was the Messiah? Well, I even earlier than that, have such a problem with consent in the story of Jesus's conception that I oh, really yeah. think that, I mean, there is no point where this very young woman was asked if anything was okay with her in terms of her own body autonomy. And I don't, that's not me trying to be irreligious or facetious, but like it would be, if it was a fairy story we'd all been told, we would now have the rebellion stories where there's the woman has some control well, over I herself. I feel like the age should have come down and said, would you be on for this? God's yeah. asked me to ask you if yeah. you would like the privilege of carrying the Messiah. And yeah. then Mary can say, yes, but it'd be great if Joseph and I got married first. Otherwise, we're going to get pilloried by the community, but we yeah. promise not to do it. And then, yeah, uh, or, but of course, or, it can't even be more, that. Mary going, Mary, what would you like to do with your life? Well, actually, I'm desperate to be a mum but Great. would like them to be very important for the rest of humanity. Ha Great. How about yeah. the Messiah? Yeah. We implant yeah. the Messiah in you in an IVF sort of way. Yeah, exactly, because it is artificial insemination. It needs rewriting. Yeah, it needs, it's just a first draft is what it is. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we're coming up with the notes. My dad's very uh, irreligious. When we were learning at school, about you know this even just, you know the story of Christmas it wasn't heavily religious but it, it was the story of Jesus' conception and my dad was like yeah she's just a kid who had underage sex and didn't want to get stoned so I obviously went into school and told all the other seven year olds oh actually she just had sex and did, didn't want to get in trouble did that go down exceptionally well with the parents and teachers yeah I got, I got put up a grade immediately they went Sarah you're a genius what, <laughs> what, what a lateral thinker you are you must be this the daughter of a jazz musician and in, whereas in fact what happened was that they, they they told me to stop listening to my dad yeah that's but your dad doesn't know everything is actually what the teacher said your dad doesn't know everything. doesn't know everything but, uh, well point, he wasn't was there like, to think, be fair I think he does I think he does actually he wasn't there, to be fair. Maybe Mary was no. visited by an angel. Do you have any more I'm a feminist buts? Um, just, I'm a feminist, but I've discovered that pregnancy is not very feminist. For instance, so far, all I've talked about is my pregnancy. You see? <laughs> and the thing, about, the thing about your own pregnancy is that no one cares. And I, when I said, in terms of your listeners, I was thinking about it earlier. There'll be people who've already had their kids, had their family, adopted their children, whatever their situation, they're just over it. Boring, done it. We've got different things to think about now. Pack lunches and stories and how early to talk to them about pornography. And then you've got people who are not interested in having kids or not interested in having kids yet. And they're like, oh, not interested, boring. People go on about it all the time, not relevant to my life. And then you have people, which is like me, which are, who are struggling with infertility. You go, oh, stop shoving your stuff down my throat. You know, I'm dealing with my own things. I don't want to have that. And then even, I thought, even if there's people listening, who are pregnant they won't care about my pregnancy they'll go what about my pregnancy why aren't you talking about They're my like, little I'm prince carrying the Messiah little princess? not you exactly you have no community anymore you're this well, one individual I was interested to hear and I am not having any babies but I still am interested to hear in that phenomenon I think especially because I haven't had any babies I'm like oh is that what happens to you uh so thank you very well, that's much that's you're a good friend Deborah I'm, I mean I am an unqualified delight and Perhaps I am the Messiah. 
There we know. go. That's the twist. There we are. That, yeah. that's, that's very probably the twist. From a variety of bedrooms and kitchens via Zoom, The Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Sarah Pascoe, and our very special guests, Megan and Bryony, talking about survivors leading essential education and change. Yay! Woo! This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, with me is Sarah Pascoe, and we're talking about survivors leading essential education and change. So, Sarah Pascoe, you brought me the idea of interviewing our guests today yeah. who are running SLEEK, which stands for Survivors Leading Essential Education and Change. What made you think this was so important? So many of the things that they uh, are saying online or had said to me in some messages that we'd shared was the first time I'd heard it. And I thought how valuable it would be because there is um, no right way to recover from trauma. There is no correct way. We are all individuals in our um, you know, most painful, traumatic moments as we are the rest of the time. And I suddenly realised what an important area of work and conversation it was. And I knew they'd be perfect for Guilty Feminist because your listeners will have such a, will have experience in their lives, such a variety of experiences. They will absolutely get that for people who've been assaulted or raped, that continues. It doesn't become, and now you're this person or this type of person, which is something that obviously is so important in feminism in general. Don't tell women how to be and how to experience things. So I just thought you'd be a match made in heaven, actually, and that more people should know about them. Well, I'm very excited to meet them. Um, can I ask you, oh, my God, look at Mouse the dog. Oh, I sent you a picture of how sulky he is because I've not done a podcast for ages and ages at home. And when I got out the microphone from the cupboard, he was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You've uh, Listeners at home, Sarah has just sent me a picture of her dog, Mouse, who has his own Instagram account. So I'm not revealing his identity wrongly. He is very upset because Sarah's not giving him any attention <laughs> and is giving attention to her microphone, which is, as far as he can make out, a bone he's not allowed to have. <laughs> and he, I've never seen Mouse look more pissed off. I feel I that's for me. But it's proper, like, what we used to call him, like, giving someone evils. Like, he's sitting there giving mm, me evils. He really, really is. Yeah. Um, now, before we bring our guests on, I want to talk to you a little bit about you are, how are you? You're quite pregnant. Very pregnant, yes. Um, 35 weeks pregnant. I'm 40 years old. Uh, it's a, a position I feel immensely grateful for because I never really thought it would happen for me. And it's been a very long journey. So I also feel like I can't moan about it. Lots of women who are pregnant might be saying <laughs> how comfortable it is now, <laughs> whereas I'm still faking a kind of like, just just the magic of life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I wanted this. I can never yeah. complain about yes. it now. Yeah. I've done the maths in my head, by which I mean quickly on my phone calculator. Mm. And it seems like you are 8.75 months pregnant. Yeah. So at any moment, you could go into labor tonight while we're on this podcast. Could do, but hopefully, hopefully won't. Um, I've got a, a C-section booked on the 8th of February. So that's four weeks away or three and a half weeks away as as we're now talking. But it would be great for the podcast if you did, if your waters broke in the next hour. Oh, really? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And then I just gave birth. And at the end, I went, guess what? A new feminist is in the world. Exactly. <laughs> and held up my tiny little baby. Exactly. See, yeah. these, are, these are the things we need to think about. Actually, so, that would be such a great sort of undermining of all of the pain of labour if I was like, I'm a feminist. And so it just didn't even hurt. Yeah, but it just yeah. popped out. It like, just popped yeah, out. Yeah. yeah. Didn't even have to do any breathing. <laughs> <laughs> if it just slid out. And then imagine how pissed off Mouse would be then, because then you would have, how do you think Mouse is going to cope with you having to attend yeah. to... A little baby. Lots of people have asked that, and um, I have no idea. I do know that if we have problems, we'll have to do training. But I, I, I hopefully he'll just be excited that there's someone else to play with. He likes meeting babies, and he likes licking them. People don't like him licking them, but when it's my baby, he can lick it. That's fine. Sure. 
I mean, yeah. you, I don't know. You may feel differently when the baby comes out. You may be like, that's what Catherine Ryan thinking. said. She said, you will realize the dog's disgusting when it wants to lick your own baby's face. And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> my, I remember my mum saying when uh, she had her first baby, she was worried the dog would be jealous because mm. it was a much adored dog. But she said the dog was actually knew that this was a new member of our pack. And the dog was very uh, loved my sister and mm. was very protective of her. If anyone came to the pram that the dog didn't know, the dog would growl and be like, is this person safe? Because um, yeah. so I'm hoping that Mouse the dog is that kind of. That's what I want. Member. The adorable meme kind of relationship between a baby and a young dog. That's what I want. Yes. Yeah. What if they end up sleeping together? Exactly. And cuddling up together. It would oh, be nice, wouldn't it? It'd be great for your Instagram. Well, I, yeah, I think it would, apart from, I don't, put, I've, I've got become really private with Instagram, so I don't think I'd put it up there. I think I'll just send it and WhatsApp it to everyone I knew instead, and then go, this is less attention seeking. Is Mouse the Dog's Instagram account still going strong? Well, though? Deborah, such a sad thing happened with Mouse the Dog, um, and it, there's a really interesting parallel. So when he was a puppy, my husband set up on Instagram and he got about 14,000 followers really quickly when he was seven weeks old. And then it slowed down by the time he was six months old. And then it plateaued and no one followed him ever again. And it, it really is like a very fast forwarded version of like aging as a woman that when he was small and cute, <laughs> everyone wanted a piece. And then it became very much like, well, now it's just a dog. He's just an adult dog. So when he was a puppy, yeah, adorable, everyone wanted to know. Yeah. And now, do you think a lot of people have muted Mouse the dog now he I, really I, is a dog? I actually think my husband doesn't post anymore because the number of likes is so low. that it's, Oh, he, he my want, God. He feels bad on Mouse's behalf. Like, he's as cute as ever. But the oh. world does not agree. Okay, so we will not be seeing a lot of Mouse and Baby action. Maybe yeah. that's why he's so pissed off, because he knows his Instagram profile. <laughs> yeah. and he's And frankly... His heft as an influencer has plummeted. Yeah, it's true. He used to get offered like dog spa days, and, and they, they call it pup fluencer. Would your would your pup fluencer like a, oh a monogrammed towel? Would your pup fluencer want this? And now, yeah, no offers are coming in. <laughs> They're like, his career is over. <laughs> that's it. At three years old, that's how sad it is for dogs. Oh, so they, they, they like understand what it's like to be a woman in your you know forties or fifties. They get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been very enlightening. And I feel like, you know, we've got feminism, but where is the caninism? Dogs and aging, there should be a whole website slash, you know, campaign about that. Would you consider doing a campaign for dogs' rights? If I didn't think that there were really more serious issues in the world and that dogs are, majority of them, pretty chipper, even with how shallow and superficial humans' treatment of them is, I would. I would be like, free university places for dogs, <laughs> dog, dog holiday camps. I would really campaign that all dogs should have everything that they wanted. I don't think they care. I think one of the wonderful things about living with an animal, and I know you've got your wonderful cats, is that they just don't care what anyone looks like. So they, they have absolutely no judgment about as in they don't care if you've put makeup on or trousers no. or washed. <laughs> and also when my dog greets people in the street, he absolutely, he doesn't have a thing where he prefers young, you know, conventionally attractive white women. He he loves absolutely everyone. He's excited exactly the same way. And I think I really respect that about you, Mouse. The, no bigotry. No no bigotry. I... He doesn't treat able-bodied people any different to disabled people. He has no racial profiling in terms of who he'll run up to and try and be friends with. And I think that that's actually what we could learn from him. Yes. Well, I mean, it sounds like he needs a TED talk. <laughs> yes. That's called, uh, yeah. I don't um, see colour, I don't yeah. see gender. And I, but I really, no, I really don't. No, I really don't. No, not there's in a, a bad way. Smash forward. Yeah, there's a smash forward to this. Like, do you remember that comedian, Sarah Pascoe? Yeah, she started trying to do TED Talks with dogs. So... <laughs> What happened we to don't her see career? Much of the circuit she anymore. blames yeah. aging, and she says that the same yeah. thing happened to her that happened to Mouse. But in fact, she actually lost the plot a little bit. She put all of her money into TEDx. <laughs> TEDx for, for dogs. dogs. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Maybe you could have a sort of a TED-like thing that was called Bark, 
uh, where yeah, that's what you'd call owners it, came you? along yeah. with their dogs, and we should probably take away the word owners because that's very territorial. Yes, yeah, Come- it's it, that's an odd one actually because it is that one of those things that exists in the language of having a pet, and even the word pet actually, there's companion. People have much better ways of phrasing. I was it. just going to say companion, but you always say it better than first. owner, owner, isn't it? So yeah. you could have yeah. a sort of companion. The, what how the the companion knows the dog the dog can't speak english or whatever the language of the country is mm. so uh the companion is going to speak on behalf of how they know the dog feels and then you mm. could give your little ted talk because i think one of my cats um seymour he has a ted talk because and i'm sorry to tell listeners this but he uh he caught a bird don't worry don't worry we let the bird go he doesn't have access to a garden, but he's got, and, he's, and our cats are ragdolls or half ragdolls. They're very, very happy in a house, but we have a terrace where birds don't come. So they're not cats, mm. but clearly a bird did fall asleep there or something because Seymour caught a bird, which we let go and the bird was okay. But the girl cats, well, they're feminist, but they were very impressed by Seymour's catch. And <laughs> they were like, wow, wow, yeah. look what he did. And after that, he, you know, he'll just kind of come in and be like, do you, oh, did, I, did I mention my TED Talk, The Perfect Catch? Mm. And he, <laughs> he mentions it like all the time. He's just like, oh, yeah. did I, did I, don't let's like the time I caught that bird. Did you, does everyone yeah. remember that? Like he's always going on about it. We're like, all right, okay, you caught one bird. You haven't <laughs> caught anything since. But the girls genuinely were impressed. They were just like, oh, Wow. It's amazing. So Mouse, a couple of weeks ago, and again, I know this is horrible for people who are listening who love animals, and it's not a behaviour I encourage. He caught a pigeon in his mouth, and he was quite surprised when it happened because he, the pigeon was in a doorway, and Mouse walked past, and he would chase a pigeon if he was out in the park, and obviously they always get away. But the pigeon was just right there, so he had it in his mouth, and then he dropped it, and the pigeon flew off. But since then, for two weeks, whenever he sees a pigeon, he does a big kind of bravado like step towards them like you want some <laughs> like I'm, I'm i'm a guy that has you in his mouth sometimes <laughs> oh. so it's not chasing it's more of like a just a, that uh, I'm talking about that male the very sh- the big man shrug that you do mm. like, i i know yeah. that i know that that sort of london puff their chest out like exactly. all right all right yeah do you want do you yeah. want any trouble you yeah you. exactly you're looking at me you want to go at me yeah uh, yeah our cats love to look out the window at but in fact that's their favorite show that when i put mm. up there's a big window upstairs and when i put the blind up in the morning they run to the window because they're like oh this is my favorite show i've yeah. been watching birds but they yeah. look at it like mouse we would watch well. a film and, but do they, do they watch people as well because mouse look, look likes watching people go he doesn't like skateboards people on skateboards but he really loves looking out of the window that exact thing of like it's tv i don't think our cats care about people at a distance if people come in yeah. here they're very intrigued they're very friendly and they'll go up they'll sniff you because that's their way of discovering mm. who you are um and be a bit like curious more than wary of you and are uh, very intrigued and they what i love about seymour sorry i'm a feminist but i'm gonna like seymour is the sweetest of the three cats yeah. toast and i have a very special bond but seymour is the sweetest if someone's having a bad day and they've come around to have a cup of tea and a, a cry seymour come and sit on their lap he's such Beautiful. a sweet boy yeah an empath he Beautiful. really he is um, you might have covered this already um in an earlier episode but i thought the stuff that the pope was saying about people having uh animals was so unhelpful and so we have not covered uh, it, so let's resent, get the fuck yeah. into that. What? Because when something so that gives people so much pleasure and joy and comfort, the idea of someone at the head of a religion saying that it's irresponsible or selfish, I, I, just, I, I was so angry with him. I was so angry okay. on everyone's behalf. He said... And he, the idea that people should be breeding instead. Yeah, he said it's selfish to have pets rather than to have children. And I'm like... Dude, you are the head of a religion in which if you take a position like the one you're in, you are literally mm. not allowed to have children. You're not allowed to have sex, let alone yeah, children. Exactly. And what do you have? Like, I'm I'm like, what in the world? You, you have priests as pets, basically. It, yeah. You have men you around rubbish, you. Rubbish pets. <laughs> rubbish pets, they'd be. And also, I guess as well, because I've had such a long journey of infertility, the idea of someone saying 
that so glibly when I just thought you absolutely don't understand what that would say to people where it, it, it actually isn't a choice. It's not an either or situation. What an unhelpful thing to say. Yeah, really, really awful. But also... It's not, it's not like it made anyone horny all of a sudden. Oh, actually, oh. thanks the Pope. Now I really want to have a sprog. Yeah, it's absolutely absurd. The population is growing exponentially. It is not really like we need desperately... Yeah. Need Our species is killing the planet, actually, the Pope. Yeah, it like, really is. Yeah. It really is. And the idea that, like... It's selfish to have a cat. It is. It really isn't selfish to have a cat. If you don't want a baby, it can be selfish to have a baby. Oh, it's awful. Yeah, especially if you're taking it to the Pope's house and going, there you go, that's that baby you wanted. Exactly. And I just think, who's he? I don't understand. Yeah. He has not got any babies. I don't want to be judged by a babyless man in a That's true. If Eureka Johnson said everyone who has pets, not children, I go, fair enough. Or if Katie Price said it, fair enough. They're doing their best to repopulate the planet. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. They'd, they'd catch a lot more flack than the Pope, let's be honest, because they're women and they'd get well, trolled. Exactly, and actually that's that's why they wouldn't say something like that, because they they'd wouldn't. go, I don't want anyone telling me what to do with my body or what my house or where I get my love and get my comfort. No. If you would rather have a cat slash dog slash echidna than a baby, then you go right ahead. There's nothing selfish yeah. about that. Our guests today are from Survivors Leading Essential Education and Changed, or SLEEK, S-L-E-C, a survivor-run organization that changes systems, supports survivors, and dismantles the roots of male violence. SLEEK fights for collective care and more radical approaches to recovery and survivor identity. They work towards rebuilding and reimagining the systems that cause harm and oppression through compassion-based education, creative media, and platforming survivor voices. Please welcome the disobedient survivors, Megan and Briny. Woo! Yay! Hey. Yes. Hi. Clapping myself. Clapping <laughs> us. Hello and welcome. Hello. Um, I'm Megan. I'm one of the co-founders of Sleek. And I'm Bryony, and I am the other co-founder of Sleek. Yeah, there's only two of us, so I don't know why I <laughs> made it sound like there was a huge organisation of people. Huge with intentions. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Energy. Well, I am so fascinated. So take us right back to the beginning, and why, why Sleek? Why does the world need it, and why did you decide to start this movement? Sort of, I guess, just to like um, start the conversation, one thing that we just want to sort of say is that everything we're talking about is our own personal experience as survivors and as individuals and you know we don't represent or speak for all survivors and also when we're using the term survivor we mean anyone who's experienced sexual violence sexual assault rape um so we just wanted to put that out there that frames this conversation um how did it start we ran away to mexico Um, did you (laughs) ran away from mexico why were you in mexico in the first place (laughs) No, we ran to Mexico. We ran, you know, we ran to Mexico. Oh, ran to away Mexico. to Mexico. Because we had been working flat out in too many projects and overexerting ourselves and running projects, working in sexual violence uh, sector. And we basically quit our jobs, quit all of our projects and our um, all commitments on our relationships and ran away to Mexico. Um, and in Mexico, we... It was the first time we'd actually done something for ourselves for ages that was like for us and for our recovery and something that was actually fun and joyous because we'd become really boring. Very dull. Um, and in Mexico, it was, we had the space to breathe and um, have fun and play. And that's when we kind of had the space and distance to work out. It wasn't that we didn't want to work in sexual violence and trauma work. It was just that the systems that we were working in and the organisation we were working in were really um, problematic and had a lot of difficulties. Um, Yeah, so I think that was like one of the main things was uh, through stepping away, we were able to see actually what is it that we want to build and create that's representative of us, not only as individuals, but people that have actually gone through the system, gone through a recovery process I mean it it was ongoing for us at the time but it was really important that we re-establish what a project would look like that actually centered 
what we would have liked to have seen. Um, right. And so we had two shitty mobile broken phones, uh, no laptop, and started the project on these like rubbish phones on a beach in Mexico, sipping tequila and eating a ridiculously big cake. And we thought, this is how every project should start. <laughs> <laughs> um and just doing photo shoots of us looking joyous and bright and everything that we hadn't seen kind of come into life so that was the kind of start in formation and it started as a essentially the resilience fund which was a financial fund for anyone who'd experienced sexual violence to apply for and that was for them to spend on whatever it was that they wanted it was totally unconditional you didn't have mm. to prove your vulnerability your deservability your financial situation it was the idea that you are autonomous in knowing what it is that you need to support yourself and sometimes we don't have the funds for that mm. um, I think that was like one of the core values like the core beliefs that we had when we set it up was stepping away from everything that recovery should not be a luxury and that was one of the kind of reasons that we set this project up. Um, the other one that kind of yeah, guided how we started was that survivors should be represented in different varied ways. Mm. There's very one dimensional mm. um, representations of survivors that we we're seeing in all of these spaces. Yeah, I think that thing about representation is so fascinating. So we should come back to it. But I thought maybe before we do, when you talk about the traditional recovery path or the things that survivors have historically been offered or are currently being offered aside from you what does that look like because lots of people listening might not know first of all it looks like very long waiting lists um, before you can access anything Um, but once you get offered support the support is often very limited um, it's time limited it's very conditional there's a lot of paperwork involved of um, accessing certain support. Um, there's a lot of paperwork involved after each session of accessing certain support, especially if that's like within a support service, like support group or in a safe house or in um, yeah, getting a support worker with a sexual violence centre. So there's admin for you to do afterwards, as in sort of how useful it was. Is it that kind of thing? So they can justify their spending? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, one of the things that we found having worked within support services quite a lot is how funders uh, put a lot of pressure on support organisations to formulate projects so that people going through their service have to kind of hit these certain goals. So recovery has to be quite linear. You have to come in one end uh, traumatised and go out the other end like, yippee, I'm healed. Yeah. And so they're trying to create these impact reports and create all this kind of uh, data that represents that that is what they're doing and that doesn't get more funding yeah and doesn't account for humanity and like the complexity of being a human and what that might come so it would be like so on a scale of one to ten how hopeful are you today and you're like wow (laughs) I had to do these forms where I literally had to ask this question to people like how much hope do you have at one to ten every two weeks (laughs) <laughs> and so I mean that's gonna it depends the day you ask me and it depends the time of the day you ask me it depends the time in my cycle you ask me it depends if someone exactly. was rude to me on the bus on the way there it depends Edward, there's Boris so Johnson much what, has done something. have I been listening to Adele yeah. it's not clear I don't know maybe I've just been listening to the Hamilton soundtrack and I'm like yes yeah. very hopeful um I'm not throwing away my shot all of those things and it's yeah. oh and a one to ten I and, yeah and how I would feel because I'm a people pleaser I would feel so pressurized to be like yeah. nine I'm nine hopeful thanks so much yeah. for everything honestly yeah. and that wouldn't be true it wouldn't like you say um it's far more complex and it's a really really can be incredibly long ongoing process maybe forever yeah. so I do that there's a number and then a box ticked and then great mm. okay off the yeah. conveyor belt you go and most most survivors know as well a bit about the system once you're in it you kind of get a picture of how it operates so you do feel like oh I've got to look like I'm improving I said six last mm. week I better say seven this week so that you because you want to you do want to please me and be like yeah you are helping so it's got to kind of go up in that linear way yeah and um, and so to go back to representation um, because obviously that's the other side of it, which isn't to do with the organisations per se, mm. but, you know, our culture, our society as a whole. Um, how would you describe, because I, I know in your literature you talk about like the perfect victim and the perfect survivor. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, for me it was um, my first kind of 
came across this idea when I first started looking into support services for myself um, when I was first addressing my own trauma. And I was sat on my laptop and I was looking at these websites and I was looking at the images and I was like, this doesn't look like me. This doesn't feel like me. This is pictures of faceless people or just a lot of hands around cups of tea, like yeah. endless hands or shadows. Um, and I'm not sat looking out of a rainy window crying right now. I went out dancing last night. I'm just looking for some support. So I was like, I'm not connecting to these images at all. And for me, I felt like if I was going to like sign up to this service and get support, was like, am I even a survivor? Because I didn't connect with that. Maybe it's people more mm. serious, like they have had something happen to them that's more serious. Or if I do go to this service, Am I going to have to now be a rape victim and have like a rape victim tattooed to my forehead for the rest of my life? Mm. Um, yeah, the idea that there's a performative kind of victimhood, exactly what you're describing, that kind of rainy, dark, hands around a cup of tea, all of it saying, oh, a broken person. Yeah. Like person who doesn't have the full range of emotions anymore, yeah. who's like grey themselves. Maybe and two on the hopefulness scale. Yeah, so two on the hopefulness <laughs> scale. You know I mean? The idea that telling people that's what they are, I don't even know if I've seen that questioned before because it's so common. It's very it's, much you know, ingrained in our um, society and I think it upholds certain structures and hierarchies that have been in place for a really long time to maintain mm. a back power dynamic. And I think we don't necessarily always go into it when we're talking about sensitive subjects like rape and sexual assault because mm. they haven't been normalised conversations for a really long time. So the fact that we're not even normalising talking about these subjects, let alone then getting into like the real root behind some of the structures that are upholding these kind of real binary like identities. And I think, you know, for me personally... And actually what was really interesting is me and Bryony had a shared experience before we even knew each other, which was both of us at the time that we were assaulted were in really like loving, committed relationships. And the first time both of us had sex, consensual sex, after our assaults, we both cried. Not because I didn't enjoy it, not because I was triggered, but because I thought that that's what a good victim and survivor would do. We see it in right. films, we see it yeah. in media, TV, the idea that you're supposed to cry after having sex if you've been assaulted. And that is not to devalue anyone's experience of that being a legitimate response. Yeah. That is completely valid. But I also think for us, that was really like infiltrated by what we had been fed over years and years and years. And I think and when we started talking about this as well, it was almost like confessionals where we're like, oh, have you, did you do this? Have you done that? I was like talking about when it first happened for me. And I'd been told by the support services that I might want to not wear sexualized clothing um, and that I probably want to wear more like baggy, baggy gray clothing. And I was like, oh, I guess that's what to do then. And started wearing that because I thought, oh, if I don't, people oh, wow. won't believe me. Um, and yeah. you probably want to stay in bed but you stay in bed and you might not want to do things. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I should probably do that. And I remember staying in bed for like quite a few days afterwards, like for a week, because I was like, that's what I should be doing. And that's what I almost performed to, because I actually felt that people wouldn't believe what had happened if I didn't. Yeah, I think that's what's so dangerous is that after an experience like that, when there can be so much self-recrimination and an unjustified recrimination, but you, you can't help go, what did I do? Like, what could I have done to not have that happen? Someone suggestively saying, well, you know, sexualized clothing and being out and about, not in your bedroom, very dangerous. <laughs> and it's like determining how we should process and heal. And I think that's something I experienced when I went through, started accessing mainstream support services was... I went in there as myself. I have always been, much to my parents' probably dismay, actually they love it, but loud, confident, opinionated, extroverted. I've always yeah. been that as a person. And when I went into these support services, quite quickly I realised that that wasn't necessarily the norm or what the sort of um, exception was, if that makes mm. sense. And I was in this service um, specifically to support me in my trial. So I had a support worker allocated to my case I worked with her for 10 months and then approaching my trial because of the requirements of the trial itself, I had to go to another city, which then meant she couldn't come with me. Not only could she not come with me, she didn't put any uh, alternative support in place. And 
her response to me going to represent myself in court on my own was, you'll be fine. Because I had presented as capable, because mm. I had presented as confident. I don't know a court of law. So I go there and have to literally stand on my own and do something that this person for 10 months had supported me with. But because this perception of the fragile, weak victim, which I hadn't necessarily been, mm. um, it was assumed that I would be okay. So it's almost like you're, I perceived it as I was being almost punished for having confidence and, and, yeah. and being sort of perceived also, as being but okay. But also their external behaviours. So actually what it is is someone saying, you're presenting like this, rather than going, that's for so many people, that's how you hide vulnerability. That's how you keep yourself safe. Just to yeah. be clear, uh, you did have a barrister though, Megan. Um, it was quite complex because it had to be via video link in another country. So I had to go to the embassy of that country. And it was really awkward because we got there and they were like, why are you here? Uh, I'm oh, here gosh. for a rape trial. Um, you know, and it's like if yeah. I had my support worker there, you know, they would have come straight in and be yeah. like, this is what's going on. I'm representing them. I've got your back. I'm advocating for you. And regardless of whether I present confident or extroverted, at the end of the day, this is an immensely like intense experience. And subsequently from that, I ended up having huge trauma because it was mm. a horrific day. Oof. Yeah, I absolutely hear that. And I think, I don't know if you're like this, Sarah, but when I did, um, this is not in any way to compare these two things, except uh, in the way that you'll see. When I did fertility treatment, my doctor said, my fertility doctor said, oh my God, I wish all my patients were like you because you're so funny. Because my response to an awkward and mm. vulnerable making mm. situation about which I'm emotional is to become very dynamic. And my joke rate has never been higher. Like, I, I mean, it, I was like, I was on a panel show the whole time, like back, back, yeah. back, back, back. <laughs> Whatever he said, I'd fire something back. And he said, Oh, mostly my clients are crying because they can't have a baby. But you're so funny. I wish I, you know, like, oh, I always look forward to seeing you. But that's my response. That doesn't mean I'm less nervous about it or vulnerable about it. Or it, it means that my way of dealing with it is to up the gags. Mm. And for some other people, it might not be gags, but it's like I definitely looked more confident. Well, comedy is quite commonly used as, um, if not an escape or coping mechanism for trauma, Um I would say it, it's, it is a coping mechanism. So most comics, when you talk to them, the reason that comedy is their tool is because, you know, bullied at school, <laughs> rejected by parents. Like They all have these reasons. So I guess it has to be part of any kind of service provider's understanding to go, that is another way of coping. Not someone who's coping so well, they're just having the best day. <laughs> yeah, don't don't need me. Go so in on your own, defend yourself, do all of that. And then you're also <laughs> having to make that joke at the door of like, not joke, but like go, Ooh, oh, I'm afraid it's for this. You know, yeah. you're having to make a face and you're having to... So of course you're going to be traumatised after that. But that's really interesting that they saw you as, you're cop you'll be fine, you're not crying all the time or you're not small. And that is not to diminish anybody's response of crying, mm. of being small. It's a most common thing, I think, is probably to cry and get smaller. But for some of us, it's to put on some bravado and that's just a mechanism within us. It's defend, you know, it's a, it's a defense and, mechanism and a protection. And the, and the wider ramifications, as well as the very personal thing that I'm so sorry that that happened to you and that you had to go through something because that's unnecessarily upsetting and making an already extremely difficult situation even more difficult for you but the wider ramifications are when people do want to take their assailant you know their rapist to court there's so much pressure to perform victim behavior Absolutely. and it doesn't feel like a choice it feels like well if you're going to stand there and coldly say they did this this they did that I absolutely remember this yes you're trying to catch me out on that question but this is what happened mm. You in the back of your head, you know, and if I now break down in tears, they're much more likely to believe me. That's the thing with um, the criminal justice system is that the perfect victim idea is most dangerous in that setting because mm. in the criminal justice system, you are expected to, if you want to be believed, uphold this ridiculous um, idea of what a victim is, which involves not ever having drunk or taken drugs. Yeah. Um, being no someone that's like entirely mentally and financially stable, whilst paradoxically being 
uh, really traumatized and <laughs> um, really um, yeah mentally unwell from the trauma. Yeah. Um, somebody that in terms of identity, you know, you've got to be petite, femme, cis, hetero, white middle class woman. Yeah. Um, you know, like we were saying, no criminal, no criminal record. No criminal record. Um, um, never I, engaged in sex, especially not like kink or BDSM out the window. Yeah. Get out. Um, so it's like you've got this really rigid binary. And so for anyone outside of that, which is a massive percentage <laughs> yeah. of the population, it's the majority, um, it very quickly and rapidly shows how little chances of not only being believed, but going through a system that is inherently misogynistic, inherently mm. patriarchal. So we're already trying to find our way in something that potentially isn't necessarily going to give us the outcome that we want. And the whole concept of justice is in this really linear, rigid process, I guess. And there doesn't seem to be any deviation or um, humanity within that. There was a friend of mine about 10 years ago and um, she stated something that was so obvious but that was so mind-blowing to me about this. Um, she had been assaulted and um, uh, she was actually assaulted by someone that she had previously had sexual encounters with. So she was in that horrible, horrific bind of um, deciding whether to go to the police knowing. Mm. And what she said was, the fact that I've had lots of sexual partners actually qualifies me to really know the difference between sex and rape. Yeah. Mm. But and, and isn't it ridiculous that that's not how we look at sexually experienced women in those situations to go, well, there's an expert right there. Yeah, if you think like, about like, yeah. BDSM or sex workers, they've got so much more experience of understanding like boundaries and consent. And yeah, they're not confused. If they, they absolutely, you know, that person was trying to hurt me on purpose, yeah. maliciously, they absolutely, yeah, should be trusted yeah. and aren't. The kink issue is so problematic because I feel like if you on an app say, oh, I, I like to be spanked or I like to be choked or I like it rough, it feels to me that as soon as you say anything like that on an app, um, and I'm not saying I like all of those things, by the way, mm. um, but it feels like immediately you give away your legal rights because it feels like then if you meet somebody and they really hurt you, they can take what's on that app and go, oh, she said she liked it rough. It yeah. went a what bit is far. like the rough, the rough sex defence that keeps happening when men have killed women, mm. and saying, "Oh no, that's what they liked," and then so uh, and then this happened because they liked it. Of course, there was a bill passed a couple of years ago in this country that means the rough sex defence can't be used. But with the numbers of men who are prosecuted being so low, I still don't trust that a woman's sexual history and her desire for uh, BDSM or s &M would not be held against her in some way and not influence a jury or a judge. I don't, I feel very, I'm delighted it's changed in law, but I'm very, it makes me feel very anxious. Can you speak to that, Megan and Bryony? I think what that kind of shows is like the scale and the like historical like relationship to pleasure and to sexual autonomy in particular in women and I think the fact that we still can't consensually and actively say I like it if you spank me I mm. like it if you whip me I like it if you do x y and z and that's taken and um, abused if you like because the foundations of kink is consent mm. you know and we talk often about if women, you know, say, oh, you know, I like rough sex and then are raped, we put that blame on a woman rather than seeing the fact that consent was taken away from them. Yeah, you know? I think the same thing actually would happen with women who say, I really like sex and then are raped. And it's like, whoa, yeah, you said exactly. you really liked it. And again, a misunderstanding which you guys have in all of the, your blogs and things about this misconstruing of rape and sex of thinking that rape is a form of sex or right. it is a, it is the sex act rather than one is an act of violence upon another person 
and it has nothing to do with it. I think the root of it is actually that all the way back to women can feel in danger by expressing any kind of love that into that. Mm. Oh, can't wait to do that. But all of it has this like small print, which is when I want to, if I want to, with you, if you, I want to, with you. Like all yeah. of it. Yeah, it's conditional. Yeah. This, yeah, disclaimers all the time. And the stronger person who is usually the man and or the person who is being dominant in that situation absolutely needs to instill and honour safe words and check in as well because some people find in that moment they can't use the safe word to ask the yep. question, how close mm-hmm. are you to using your safe word? But also to use their own restraint to not really hurt somebody. That idea that you cannot be a victim or a survivor if at any point you've expressed an interest in kink, mm. either previously or to this partner, is so terrifying to me. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's, there's another side to it, actually. Um, someone I interviewed a few years ago in therapy, and, and this person had quite a, I had, you know, I'm a very vanilla person, so their life was very exciting sexually in terms of their expressions and the things that they were willing to say yes to. But they were also in therapy um, because of mental health problems, but caused by abuse, uh, sort of teenage, uh, when they were a well, child. And um, their therapist so unhelpfully linked the two and, and was like, oh, your sexual expression is excessive because you're trying to gain back control from your childhood. She wasn't allowed to just like kinky sex. She wasn't allowed to make those decisions. Someone else said that's because you're... It's always like that victim. in movies as well. If you ever see yeah. kink in movies, it's always, yeah, but that's because of, and it's like mm. not true. So many people are kinky and it's nothing to do with that. It's just... And it's unhelpful. It's really unhelpful. Same with like porn workers or sex workers, people who want to see that as a form of victimhood as well, rather than a separate choice. And that's something that we see as well in support services, um, survivor yeah. services, like a lot of survivors that we know and have talked to, um, and ourselves included, support workers have found sex very uncomfortable and have seen them as linked with rape and that sex will be triggering because you've been raped and that if you are now exploring BDSM or kink, that is an unhealthy coping mechanism wow. or that it's like a, a trauma, trauma response. Oh, to right. your to your experience and um, that can be really really dangerous because somebody's mm. actually working on a really healthy part of their sexuality and then being told that that's part of their trauma and that can really mess you up yeah absolutely uh, especially with when a healthy sexuality is not only vital to you know your own mental well-being and happiness mm. but also is a proof of growth and strength mm. and being able to be proud of it and enjoy it. The idea of you're then getting this, um, I guess, shame. You're being yeah, told yeah. by someone else. Yeah, that's um, so destructive. And who knows? Maybe some of it is. Like we're complex. Human beings are so complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe for some people, some of their kink is linked in some way to some trauma mm. at some times. For other people, yeah, maybe not at all. Some people are sex workers and they enjoy it and it's their preferred profession and it's a great way to earn money. Some people don't like being in sex work and they feel it's their best option. And I think we are all complicated and nothing is one thing. I think as sometimes liberal people as well are really guilty of going, it's all good for everyone all the time because I'm not allowed to say, you know, Mm. like that's not necessarily true. Somebody (laughs) may want to work through their kink because they don't really enjoy it. It's the only way they can get aroused, but they wish it wasn't. And they want to work with a therapist. Somebody may want to get out of sex work and it's never anything they've wanted Mm. or enjoyed and they want other options and they feel that that's the socioeconomic corner they've been backed into. And Mm. and I think that doesn't mean every sex worker doesn't want to do sex work. It doesn't mean everybody who wants to be spanked needs to get over it. That's just not Mm. true. And I think (laughs) it's human beings are complicated, society is complicated, and those resources and support services should be there for anybody who wants them and needs them, but we can't start imposing our values on people who tell us, no, this is what I'm into. This is what I like. This is my living. This is enjoyable for me. This not so much, but I don't mind. And Mm. so on and so on. We've got to listen to each other. 
I guess that's the work that you guys are doing, isn't it? Is to create awareness of the variation of human responses. Totally. I think it says a lot about our society or, our, you know, the world in which we operate in where someone tells you your experience, you know, and they are honest and open and say, this is what I've experienced and this is what I want. And we go, no, that's not what you want. Mm. That's not what, because I know what you want, because we've had this format for a really long time, which hasn't actually been working. Um, yeah. But but because it's just ingrained in our society and because we're resistant to change it or to challenge it, then actually what you're saying is not true. I mean, it's like global gaslighting, um, mm. you know, on a mass scale and Sleek, the project that we run, is about really trying to flip that on its head and be like, right, we are human first and foremost. And that means we're flawed, we're complex, we make mistakes, we're sexy, we like to fuck, we don't like to fuck, you know. It's like mm. we're joyous, we laugh. Heaven forbid we laugh, you know. It's like how <laughs> dare you yeah. laugh and have humour mm. because you've been like through a trauma. And it's yeah. like, well, laughter and humour is like the bedrock of humanity. So let's bring that in. And that's something that we're really trying to do in a way that's like true and authentic to us. And I think, you know, our the work that we do and in particular our you know our social media I guess is our sort of like safety community where we can really authentically be ourselves and give out this other alternative narrative which is you get to decide how you want to express and communicate yourself to the world and that might include your experiences or your trauma or it might not but whatever Mm. you do is is so important that it's in line with who you are and I think because we haven't necessarily always been given the space in and outside of trauma in and outside of like personal experiences we're often not given the space to be ourselves and so we're trying to do that in a really (laughs) cheesy way (laughs) yeah (laughs) so Megan and Bryony can I ask a question if a professional said to a survivor often in our experience we find survivors of sexual assault don't want to do anything for a little while and they need to go to bed that may or may not happen to you don't feel obliged to you know to do that you may want to really go for a run you may need to be with people but if you feel like you need to go to bed you go to bed and don't feel guilty about it would that be a better way of saying it because I understand the impetus for somebody to say don't feel guilty if you just need to sleep how would you say in your lived experience you would like that to be presented to you and other survivors? I think it's about the way that you say it. Like how you said it then is not how it's been said to me or how um, other people I know have had it said to them. So it's rather than presenting something as you are likely to feel this. I've heard a lot of like shoulds and that mm. you probably will uh, or, and this is likely for you because of trauma. And that kind of creates an assumption and you kind of then feel like you should be doing those things if you're experiencing trauma. If you say to somebody, oh, you've been through something really difficult, so any response is okay because however you want to deal with it is okay. But if you're feeling like you don't want to get out of bed for days, don't, that's totally up to you. You deserve to rest, do whatever makes you, whatever whatever meets your needs. It's okay to kind of mention things that might come up in trauma that you're seeing a lot of but I think to make assumptions and to not talk about or not to mention that there are so many different responses to trauma can make somebody feel very very isolated if their response isn't that Mm. and then Mm. you feel you question yourself for that maybe uh, maybe what happened to me wasn't as bad as I thought it was maybe it wasn't rape at all maybe um maybe I've made it up maybe maybe it was consensual sex and you have all of these thoughts going around your head because you're in a state of trauma and you're not doing what you feel is expected of you. Now, what you're being told is this idea of survivor and this idea of uh, recovery. Instead of the imagery of hands around cups of tea in front of rainy windows, mm-hmm. what would you like to see? I'd like to just see more human pictures. I'd like to see survivors with heads. For a start. Um. Or a face. <laughs> and no hands. Um. Yeah. Well, hands. Whatever. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to go onto a website. And some websites uh, now I've seen don't have any pictures, and that's that's kind of okay if it's kind of completely mutual and it's just text. Um, but seeing survivors as humans, so maybe there's some pictures where you're displaying a range of emotions. So not just looking just 
broken and just um, hidden and just a kind of empty silhouette or shadow where you're seeing people that you could maybe connect to. So all different types of people, mm. um, all different That would be so bodies. important because yeah. I can't imagine anywhere where it's more important to know that it's people like you and people yeah. different from you and all kinds of people and it's none of yeah. their faults. Yeah. 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 And imagery is such a powerful tool to elicit something, uh, a feeling or an emotion or a connection. And I think we often do it a disservice in terms of representation and in terms of how we can feel seen and validated. You know, if you were to see a, a complete mixture of different people with different life experiences, with different identities, in a different range of emotions, you know, like on our Instagram, there are literally images of me with my mouth wide open because I sleep, like I'm literally trying mm. to catch the entire world <laughs> in my mouth, you know, and it's yeah. like, uh, or like there's pictures of Bryony with huge bags, no offence, <laughs> crying, you yeah. know, and it's like, that's real that's honest it's mm. not about us trying to capture this moment of this like perfect image it's about us also being naked as well if we want to and that's not to say anyone who's gone through any trauma has to suddenly love their body and yeah. love their sexuality at all it's about seeing different examples of different experiences in life within a collective experience and then that sh changes the whole game you know and instead suddenly it's making it human because mm. I think a lot of sexual trauma, sexual violence, sexual assault has become so dehumanising in the way we talk about it in media, our language and day-to-day -day life, that it's taken that, like, realness out of it. So we're trying to, I don't know, inject some, like, life into it. The other thing I think is with, with charities is often I think some of the imagery is used so that the survivors kind of look helpless like they need rescuing yeah so that people will give money to so it's a fundraising helpless thing. that's survivors. what actually yeah that's what it reminded me of is all of those adverts where they want you to give to certain countries and how unhelpful people from those countries find that imagery yeah and it's exactly the same thing as you're talking about you know distended bellies and flies used to land on children and things that yeah. were um yeah really undermining it's interesting i've not really thought about how performative we have to be before but i've gone to trials with a couple of friends over the years who have been victims of uh of sexual assault and it's true if somebody in a very clear and calm way says this is what happened to me the judge is much more likely to go you can see it like you know that yeah. everyone in the courtroom is looking to that survivor to demonstrate look how hurt i am and mm. if they don't want to show that to the perpetrator who's standing right opposite them, they don't want to go, yeah, you broke me, What? look at me and have the satisfaction of knowing how devastated I am. Their chances of a conviction, which are already low, become lower. And isn't mm. that an extraordinary thing, even though the mm. facts are the facts? I haven't really thought about that before. And I think what you're saying is so powerful. How are you campaigning to change these things? Yeah, first and foremost, I think, is we are trying to show an alternative, show different types of survivors. So starting with how we started showing, doing little like videos of ourselves, just doing human things, like we take pictures of us, like getting ready to go out or like trying to do face yoga and having hysterics because it doesn't actually <laughs> it's ridiculous. do anything. Gives you more wrinkles because <laughs> it's so hilarious. Um, <laughs> and yeah we've just this year we've um just started a blog called the disobedient survivors blog where we are now trying to platform um all different survivors voices so we're getting submissions of people write different people writing about uh challenging the stereotype of what a survivor is and that's going to be something that's going to be ongoing i think um, that's going to be such an amazing resource for people because i think i can imagine if if someone was in a position of going, I don't know what the future holds for me. I don't know my next stages. I don't know how I'm going to. The idea of being able to read lots of different people who had completely different mm. next stages and would just be so um, positive. I think that would be a nine on the hopeful scale. <laughs> That's what we like. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Are you campaigning to get government support services? to change their language and their imagery and their perception of who might 
need their support service worker to go with them right to the end, for example, mm-hmm. uh, and not to be seduced into thinking if someone seems confident they don't need the full service. This is what we want to be doing more of this next year. So we've started, um, well, we've planned lots of different training programmes and we're looking at going to work with support services um, and doing training, survivor-led training about um, language, imagery, representation and how they support survivors and what we know survivors have told us. So it's all informed by all different survivors that have told us what isn't working and what is working for them. So that's something that we're going to work on this year. Yeah, we also want to try and create um, imagery ourselves that we can offer to people. So getting survivors, um, creating photo shoots of survivors to show what an alternative could look like. Because I think that's the thing that isn't really an alternative to look at. And organisations are going to do just kind of the same things as each other because that's the standard. So we want to create a kind of mock website to show this is what you could do, this is what your website could look like with real examples of different types of photographs and imagery that could be used and campaigns to move forward with that. Presumably you have to find survivors who are willing to be photographed because not everyone might feel safe uh, sharing it or, yeah. or comfortable sharing their identity for any number of reasons. Absolutely. And part of the work that we do at, at Sleek that is fundamental is we would pay anyone who chose to or wanted to have their imagery used because often or not, survivors or those that have experienced sexual based violence, often we have to tell our stories for free or we have to give our expertise Mm -hmm. and our labour and our energy for free. And we need to start changing that. And we need to be like, no, you're an expert in what you're talking about because it's from a lived experience and it's from a place of real true understanding. So we are then going to compensate you for your time. So the work that we want to do is central to not only the people that we're coming into contact with through our project, but also to ourselves. I think it's really important that when we talk about this project, we always try and use the word our, you know, when it's not they, it's not us, it's our experiences, it's our way of moving forward. Like we don't separate ourselves from the work in which we're doing. And I think in the past when we did projects, it was very much like I'm over here, you're over there, even though we have a shared experience. And actually that's not how you build community. Community from the ground up is we're all in this together. We all might have different needs, but if we can start from a common ground then actually we can only get stronger um and I think one thing just to mention that we're really wanting to sort of explore moving forward is we've talked a lot about the perfect victim but we also want to talk about what the perfect perpetrator is Mm. and what that looks like in terms of things like language and imagery again so we often say crime instead of harm we often say blame instead of accountability and some of the work that we've been starting to get into and explore is the idea of what alternative justice could look like um the idea of um working with people that have caused harm and reframing it so that we go right you have caused harm you now need to go in through a process of understanding what it is that you did that impacted on another human and then you can kind of come back from that not always Mm. but the system we have at the moment is you're a rapist you're a perpetrator you're a criminal and that's with you for life Mm. so you potentially could perpetuate or or continue that cycle because society has said that is what you are so we're trying to come at it from a perspective that okay what if we could work with those that have caused harm and create a space or a process which actually gets into the root of what is happening in the world, which is, you know, male violence. Mm. You know, how do we get in there to begin with? Yeah. Um, and then and then of course that's the only way of preventing future harm. That that is the only thing that you can do because you can't people don't get locked up forever for those crimes. Right. And they go into a system that not necessarily is gonna like, you know, quotation mark re- rehabilitate and so you know that's something that we as individuals as survivors and where we are within ourselves this project and our own experiences feel we can start creating that space to really go into that um Um, can I ask one of the things I read oh one of the things I was looking at one of your events and it said that later on there would be an event for um cis men because obviously um and we haven't said this we haven't been saying that only ever women are victims of these crimes because I think another complicating element in the whole individuality of survivors and the way that people perceive certain things 
um, and it can be so difficult for men who've experienced sexual assault and rape because of this, because of the expectation that it's um, that it's a weakness or that it can't happen to men, or that that there there aren't any male rape victims, and so or they should have stopped it because they're strong enough and they don't get the same uh, sympathy as women. Yeah, so it has a different uh, set of complicating, but it still has all of the stigma, all of the isolation, and the not proper support not efficient support I should say is that something that you're also sort of I mean you've got enough on your plate already so feel (laughs) free to say (laughs) we're not doing that yeah first world domination then (laughs) yeah um yeah with with the next uh radical healing festival we're doing we're gonna have um part of that is going to be dedicated to um yeah cis men that experience sexual violence because I think that is something there's a massive gap in um, mm. in support services as well it's it's more underfunded so there are less services that are dealing with yeah. that and like you said the whole perfect victim thing a man just does not fit into that at all no. so no. and, and they're often men aren't even mentioned in conversations at about all. rape and yeah. sexual assault unless it's as perpetrators but not yeah. ever as um yeah they're not even considered in it and for some men that exclusion is really marked every time there's a conversation yeah you know, yeah, friends of mine who've been sexually assaulted who are men who talk about it and, you know, it's traumatised their whole life. It's changed yeah. their whole life. And as a society, we really discuss it very little. But how do we stop? Because it is almost always men committing sexual assault. Uh, how do we stop this next generation? And, again, if you think this is not my remit, we're two women with an Instagram account who are now trying to change the world – uh, but how do we stop this next generation of boys coming up? How do we educate? How do we change this narrative? Um, well, one thing that we see as really important is inviting men into this conversation. So we started last spring, we started the men's emergency men's learning course where we ran a four session over four week course um, online with men to talk about all the things that we talk about in a space where they could actually feel comfortable asking all of these difficult questions. Because I think one of the things that men find really difficult is there are some areas for them that feel grey, but they don't know how to ask them because they are terrified of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing or being cancelled. So we created a space where we were like, we have experienced sexual violence and we are happy to answer any questions around sexism, around sexual violence around all these difficult questions that you might have for what is right what is wrong and we might not have answers at all but this is a space where you won't be judged you there's no expectation of you and there's no stupid questions and we're going to put everything on the table and discuss that and the courses were incredible Mm. the men were so honest and open and it was such a beautiful space Uh, and I think like the the root of what we were doing was this starts with compassion first and it starts with non-judgment and it starts from the idea that we're not here to tell you what to do we are part of this journey with you like this is about actually building a community where collectively we can actually like fight and change and challenge and like resist what has been keeping us all down for such a long time but we need you men to understand our experiences as women in order for you to build that empathy and have that understanding with the knowledge that you're also impacted by a lot of these structures and I think that's how we come at it in particular with younger generations I mean we're we're millennials and shit's changed so much even from (laughs) when we were younger do you know what I mean it's like I hear like 16 year olds talking about like is it okay if I touch your shoulder I'm like are you fucking joking that's incredible like you know so it is it is shifting but I think we need more spaces where there's this like understanding that you can say and it's not about saying whatever the fuck you want it's about saying I have wanted to ask this question because I genuinely want to know but I've been a bit scared to ask it because of a fear of maybe how I'm going to be perceived because often we're quite quick to go ah you got it wrong and therefore you're not right being confused or feeling ignorant is a position of vulnerability and it's something that as humans we are hiding all of the time (laughs) like pretending we know what we're doing we know where we're going and actually it's such a good point that that's an area of danger for men 
because if it's too embarrassing to ask and then you physically make a kind of terrible transgression based on that ignorance. Yeah, and I think what a really important thing with what we need to see more of in terms of like this sort of education learning space is something me and Bryony did throughout, which was humour. You know, it was so important. Like we would often be laughing because mainly because of our tech skills, but also the <laughs> fact that we can rip the shit out of ourselves yeah. as women because we're confident in our experiences. But I think for men that really like I did, it and um, yeah, makes it more accessible, I think, because it's it's terrifying for men to talk about male violence because there's all mm. this fear about blame and being responsible and it being really overwhelming. What do I do? How can I change this? I don't want to my identity to be represented like this and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. But being able to be like, look, we're going to talk about this in a space where we can make jokes, where we can laugh about the ridiculousness of mm. things, but we can also put everything on the table. Um, so I think what one of the things we really want is to pe- people to start having more conversations about these issues, like putting things on the table and not being so afraid to talk about things. Mm. And I always think like most men I've ever met have not hurt me. Like it's, I think the job that most men have to do who don't hurt anybody have to do is to, to make sure this is not seen as normal by the men who do hurt people. The, yeah. the, the, it's a cultural problem where we have to, as a culture, go, no, you're not the normal one if you hurt anybody, yeah. Yeah. women or anybody. And we really need to get that work done because I think we are in a bubble and out there there's a whole world going on where men who hurt people are and men who hurt women specifically are just seduced by societal jokes and norms and ideas and films into thinking it's normal when it's not. Most men don't do this. So I'm really grateful for your program and your efforts and uh it's truly amazing what you're doing how can we help give us loads of money (laughs) okay so you need money how can people donate money to sleek um how can you help yeah um you can actually (laughs) that wasn't a joke um Um. (laughs) yeah we have a a patreon um, which is on our website and um or can make one-off donations because we have um the fund still running as well so you can donate money so that uh, survivors can get out funds to support themselves or to support our work. I was just um, going to say, actually, and while we're talking about money and that exact thing, um, my mum used to work for the NHS and um, her PCT, which is in Cambridge, realised exactly what you understand, which is that for some patients with um, mental health problems, and some of them had had brain injuries, what the, the things that they needed weren't medical it wasn't they needed an injection. It wasn't that, I mean, they had their medication. And so they started a sundries fund. And what they bought for people was, and, and it, it, it was an interesting list. Like, so for one person, it was a sat nav and they had, he had no money, but he had lost the fun, his, his memory function with, he was getting lost all the time, which is very dangerous. It's very scary. And so the NHS bought him a sat nav that he could walk around with that would help him walk around. And another woman, she was really struggling with, um, rages and she was a single parent and what was so hard was that her children had to see and she was out of control of these things and they would pass but she had such immense guilt that her children would be so upset so they built her a um like a gazebo in the back of the garden so she had a place to go where she her children were still safe but they didn't have to see it and she could come back but then the horrific thing is that the press found out and It was reported by these newspapers, and when I say these newspapers, also Radio 4, all the journalism was the same, which was NHS buying satin-outs and summer houses. They made it out to be MPs' duck houses. Exactly, and if anyone had actually found out, no one would think that was unreasonable. And in every single case, it was saving the NHS money because they were coming to the hospital less. They had to see their GP less. They needed to see their therapist less. Though we have to open our mind to those kinds of things as part of healing and treatment and staying well. Yeah, and those practicalities. If that's yeah, what you need are, and that's going to fix it and that's going to make your life work, yeah. then why would we not buy that, as you say, rather than let that exactly. person again 
go round in this cycle. And also, not most people can't afford things. Well, lots of people can't afford things like that. And actually, that's something else that you guys wrote about that we should quickly mention is that middle class people often understand better in terms of asking for care and what they're entitled to. And so that what ends up is that there is a class divide in terms of getting yeah. support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, completely. Because and you... what I guess middle class people can pay for themselves as well. If you need a sat nav or, I mean, now people have got sat navs on their phones, presumably that was from a time mm. before then. Yeah. But if you need a new phone with a new app on it that costs five pounds a month or you, you know, whatever, middle class people, you know, refer to throwing some money at the problem. Totally. I think one of the things we found with the mini grants, and this is something down the line, which we would really love is to be able to offer bigger amounts of money so that one day we could have it where someone's like, shit, I can't pay my rent this month. Cool. Here's, mm. I mean, come yeah. on, rent's so expensive nowadays, but <laughs> we're, we're thinking global, you know, it's yeah. like, here's a grand to cover your month's rent. And I think it's yeah. really important that we recognise we live in a classist system and therefore recovery isn't always accessible to everyone so if for us with this mini fund it was founded in the idea that we don't dictate how you spend the money to bring you joy to bring you resilience Mm. to bring you power to bring you strength to bring you comfort in a time where you feel low or depressed and that might look like a sex toy for one person and it might look like a basic need for someone else like going towards a a gas or electric bill Mm. you know it's like we have to start normalising the idea that people can take control of what it is that they need. But we also need to be providing that. And it's about redistribution of wealth. So what we would really like and hoping to move towards is bigger chunks of money for our fund so we can give that out to people and, you know, actually start to see the distribution of wealth that we really need, like now. We needed it yesterday. So that's one of the ways. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we've also got a, another one of our men's emergency learning groups coming up. So if That'll you know a website, man. yeah, or are a man, um, it's kind of hard not to know a man, um, then get them signed up. Um, it's a four week course, um, lots of resources, lots of sort of activity based things. I mean, it's how often do they go? It's not a four week full time course. No, it's uh, one session. Um, every Wednesday for four weeks um, Great. and you get resources in between. Um, and Super. It's, uh, uh, there's so, three places for anyone that can't afford it. So everyone should follow Sleek, which is at? Sleek. At Sleek underscore Proj, Sleek with a C. So if everybody could follow at Sleek underscore Proj and uh, see what they've got going on, your website is? It's uh, Sleek Net. And whether you're someone who thinks you would benefit from resources for survivors or someone who would like to recommend that a man come along or you are a man that would like to come along to one of the workshops or you're someone who would just like to give some money regularly because you think what these two incredible young women are doing is wonderful, uh, then go on and look at their Patreon on how you may help in another way. Uh, but engage with this in any way you can, because it's really a remarkable thing that you came up with when you ran away to Mexico. And we're glad that you did. Uh, Megan and Bryony, is there anything you came to say that you didn't get to say? Probably a million things. Loads of stuff. Um, <laughs> but we will be saying stuff um, on our Instagram and also, I did just think of something. Um, if you are listening to this and you're from an organisation, whether that be a workplace, institution, you know, business, whatever it is, and you would like some training in your workplace around looking at sexual harassment, looking at how to make uh, spaces safer. Um, we also offer training and consultancy. That's on our website as well under our training and consultancy. Great. And if you're a big corporate, please pay them the big bucks. Yes, thank you very much. They will be able to (laughs) pay themselves and be to first some of those funds to uh, extraordinary things. Uh, Any I'm a feminist butts before you go? Well, I thought about this while we were doing this and also because I do this all the time, but I'm a feminist butt. I will interrupt every single woman when she's talking in particular when she's talking about being interrupted so that I can talk about how I always get interrupted whilst interrupting them. So that's my I'm a feminist, but...
I do that too. Yeah. I do that too, interrupting people. I get too excited. Same. And it's actually, it's a sign of me going, oh my God, I love what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm going to talk about it over you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. discovered yeah. I've got ADHD and that's why I'm interrupting you right now. I follow all the accounts now and I'm like, oh my God, I do that all the time. I've tried <laughs> over the years to stop interrupting people on the podcast. But it is, it's a sign of my brain is here. It's connecting with your oh. brain. And so it's like, in my head, it's a compliment, but I really try and stop myself because I know that you're not, it's it's not an ideal way to Can I ask you both a question? Of course. Wait, can you talk and listen at the same time? Because I think part of the reason I do it is that I don't expect the other person to stop talking. Yeah. I can listen to them yeah. and talk as well. I yeah. think that, I think I can do that, whether I actually can or not. But I think <laughs> yeah. that I can, definitely. <laughs> I, that's a great question. I don't, I'm trying to compute that in my mind, mm. probably because I'm so inherently and in, interrupted that that's never been a concept for me to even process or like unpick. Yeah. Um, maybe. But watch yourself next time if you stop listening, because my two best friends from university, so they're still my best friends. None of our boyfriends or now husbands have ever liked being around us because all three of us just talk at once. Yeah. <laughs> like a tr- and no one needs to ever be quiet but because we can all just enthusiastically and um, with men have always hated it because mm. they're waiting for their chance to speak. Yeah, no, no chance never come. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely no They've chance said to be around. They have. They've had 10,000 years to talk. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's your turn. It's our yeah. turn. Um, Sarah Pascoe, do you have anything to plug? I actually do. I'm going on tour from November. And it's a, a show about, it's called Success Story, and it's about work and fertility and funny things that have happened. And, um, so yeah, touring from November into 2023. And there's a website called sarahontour.com, which has all of the venues and dates, and all of the shows have a BSL or an ISL interpreter, because I discovered that's a very easy thing to organise. Fantastic. So Sarah Pascoe's Success Story, you will be maybe taking your munchkin on tour. Yeah, that's that's all left up. We, I don't know yet, basically. I don't know what the munch is going to be like. Yeah, well, I don't know what they're going to be like. And other people keep, every, everyone has an opinion about how awful that might be. I, so. I'm not going to pass one. I don't I don't yeah. know. Don't mind. Yeah. I mean, you, you and that baby will figure it out together, I'm fairly yes. sure. Uh, well, I hope that baby is the Messiah and he's talking by the time that tour is on and uh, you can bring him <laughs> he's out. my opening act. Yeah, yeah, he could bring him out. He could walk on across a paddling pool, something like that. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> have a wonderful time. Everyone should book tickets right now for Sarah Pascoe's tour. Thank you so much, Sarah Pascoe. Woo! Thank you, Deborah. You have been listening to Guilty Feminists with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Sarah Pascoe, and our very special guests, Megan and Bryony. Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge and produced by Nick Schell, and the producer was Tom Salinsky from the Spotted Data Shop. Thanks to Rachel Kraft, Regina Dizzi, and everyone who makes this episode happen, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Woo! Good I am. You're basically like Mouse the Dog, aren't you, when you're not the centre of attention? Yeah. The audience won't know oh. what that means because we haven't done that bit. This yeah. is before that bit. It just seemed like a weird non sequitur Joe. And then she called one Mouse and a Dog. <laughs> You've got another <laughs> feminist part. I do. And um, so I'm a feminist, but... The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.